Well, today in the world, on media especially, Christians have a bad reputation. And if we are honest, I think much of it is deserved. Uh, but, I'm all, but it's always been, throughout history, hard to declare loyalty. And what I'm going to say now might be very ironic, but I have a natural aversion to making statements with clothing. Huh? Huh? You guys don't think that's ironic since I wear a priest collar all the time and these big outlandish robes? Okay, never mind. <laughs> I have never liked uh, shirts with big logos. I've never owned any shirts that advertise for a uh, politician. In the past, I had this basic uniform and I stuck with it. Golf shirt and shorts. Plain colors. And of course, this all changed when I started working in youth ministry. I remember the first time I wore a Christian t-shirt. It was a college student and I had spent the summer, I was going to spend the summer being an intern for a youth ministry. And my friend who was a youth minister gave me a youth group shirt to wear and it had this huge passage of scripture on the back and it was the 90s so it was in puffy paint and I was embarrassed to wear it and I was embarrassed to tell him that I didn't have any shirts like that this was the only one of these that I owned and to be honest I noticed people looking at me when I was walking around town it might have been my imagination and of course, now I wear a black shirt and a priest collar, and it seems, you know, pretty tame by comparison. But at the time, I thought about it a lot more than I should have. I studied the scripture on the back of the shirt in case somebody asked me about it. What does that mean? Um, so I could respond. And I was hoping it would lead to a conversation, maybe a soul-saving conversation. So I had to be ready, and I had to wear my puffy paint Christian t-shirt. By the year 2000, I had a lot of Christian t-shirts. And we used to sing this song in the youth group. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. You guys know that, right? Well, we changed the words in the youth group. And they'll know we are Christians by our shirts, by our shirts. Well, the Christian t-shirt of the 90s has nothing on social media today. Someone can look at your social media accounts, and if we provided it, they could find out our religious and political affiliation in a matter of seconds. If you check mine, you'll notice my political affiliation is the Swedish Senior Citizens Interest Party. <laughs> trying to pick the most neutral thing. <laughs> but despite the truth that posting on social media isn't actually going to affect change, that needs to be said, other than the kind of change that comes from opinions stated apart from body language, tone of voice, and personal relationships, there is this unwritten pressure that we all feel to respond on social media to every event or controversy that happens. You know what I'm talking about. This pressure to declare allegiance or loyalty is not new. It's as old as humanity, and it's not new to scripture. A priest collar, a t-shirt, or a social media post seem a lot easier, though, than circumcision. <laughs> Thanks for paying attention to that one. <laughs> The question, how to identify a disciple of Jesus, was especially important during the time of Jesus, and it was especially important for that early persecuted church, and it's a big issue in John's Gospel. Why, Tom? Well, let me tell you. Um, lately, people are calling John the anti-Semitic Gospel. Because just like we read in our scripture reading this morning about these Jews, it keeps mentioning the Jews and they're constantly mentioned. But you should know this is an issue of translation. 
The word often translated Jew in the English translations of the Bible can also be translated Judean. And most of the people in the time of John's gospel and the time of Jesus thought that following Jesus was about the region you came from. You see, the Galileans, which they called Jesus, were the people of the land, the farmers, the country folk, the uneducated. And they rallied around this new Messiah who fed them in the wilderness, who gave them a chance to throw off the oppression of Rome. And the folks in the city, the Judeans, who were connected to the temple and Jerusalem and the Pharisees and King Herod, didn't like Jesus because he threatened their power. And we see that in John's Gospel. Peter is warming himself by this charcoal fire and he's talking to the people and they hear his accent and they say, you're a Galilean, you must be with Jesus. And he denies him three times. But it was a good assumption that they made. The people of Galilee did follow Jesus. So John's Gospel is a window into a family argument between Jewish cousins. And they're trying to make sense of the world after the temple has been destroyed, after Jerusalem has been destroyed. They're trying to make sense of what happened. And it's also a window into the lives of the disciples. Because when persecution happened, it was easy to run. Our gospel reading in John 13 takes place just after Judas has left to betray Jesus. And it takes place just before Jesus tells Peter he'll deny him three times. And so this what makes what Jesus has to say to us this morning, his promise and his command, stand out even more like a warm fire on a cold, rainy night. The promise is that God will be glorified by what's about to happen and his command to love each other flows out of what happened on the cross. It's not that Jesus has got this new cool command about loving each other and he's just tacking it on to all these Jewish legal requirements. The point was that his life his act of sacrificial love were meant to show us who God is, God's heart. And as we love each other, as we welcome the stranger as they did in Acts in our reading, as we continue the mission of Jesus and we show God's love and God's glory to the world. There are many Greek words for love. And this isn't the word for friendship. This isn't the word for romance. This is the one for sacrificial love. God's agape love. It's appropriate that we're talking about this on Senior Sunday. Today we celebrate these nine or eight, or I didn't count, these folks <laughs> sitting up here on the front row we're going to send them off into the world to learn and grow. And you won't be able to live by the love of Jesus on your own. You won't. You'll need community. And you'll need the Spirit. We also heard about that in our reading from Acts. And I've seen the same story repeated over and over, especially where I came from. Grew up with this kind of simplistic, elementary understanding of Scripture, real literal, because we think the Bible should be read the same way an eighth grade history textbook is read. And then we go off to college and we learn about symbolism and metaphor and we really dive into evolution and we see some mean-spirited Christian groups on our college campuses and we say, I don't want anything to do with this Jesus or this Christianity thing because they're just judgmental, anti-woman, anti-immigrant, anti-gay, and we could go on and on. But this morning, I want you to know, you 
eight to 10 folks who are sitting on the front row. From Jesus' own lips in John's gospel, the heart of this God whom we serve is sacrificial love. Jesus said, love one another. This is how the world will know you are my disciples. Don't let some angry people define for you what being a disciple of Jesus means. I hope that you will think too much of God and God's Son to let some angry people be God's loudest representation in the world. Here's a simple question for you to ask. Are these people using God to baptize their own agenda? Or are they asking this question? What is God doing and how can I be a part of that? And the key to knowing the difference is to look for signs of sacrificial, self-giving love. What, am I, what do I mean? We hear a lot of bad stories about Christians, so let me tell you some good stories. Let me tell you about William Wilberforce, who was an Anglican living in England in the early 1800s, and his priest was a guy named John Newton who had been a slave trader and he had come to know the amazing grace of God, and he wrote this hymn that we still sing today called Amazing Grace. And William Wilberforce went before the parliament as a young man, and he said, the slave trade is wrong. It violates the love of Jesus. We need to change it. We need to stop it. And everyone said, do you know how much money is behind this? Do you know how much money, how this makes politics go around in our empire? and he wouldn't stop. And he sacrificed his reputation and his family and his standing, but eventually the people listened. And 50 years before we could get up the courage, the British people banned slavery and the slave trade. Let me tell you about William Temple, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he's walking through the streets of London, and he sees these Oliver Twist scenes that we hear about in Scripture. And he sees children working in factories. He sees hands being cut off. He sees children losing fingers. And he said, you know, we need to take the weekend off as a nation, and we should probably not let children under a certain age work in dangerous factories. And the people listened. Let me tell you about Martin Luther King, who was inspired by the nonviolent love of Jesus. And he changed our nation. Let me tell you about Desmond Tutu, who lived in an apartheid ridden South Africa, who went to his, who's, whom the British made the archbishop in an apartheid nation. He was an African man, and he along with others, helped that nation throw off an oppressive system because it didn't jive with the love of God and Jesus they saw in Scripture. Don't just look at the bad stories. There are plenty. Look for the self-giving, sacrificial love of people and of our Lord. It's not by our t-shirts, not by our Facebook status, not by our political affiliation, but by our love. That is how we should be known.